Hey everyone, it's Amanda Layden here from the Vino Karma Project. And on today's episode, we are going to talk about the differences between Prosecco and Champagne. So if you've ever wondered why they are different and maybe why Champagne costs so much, stay tuned and watch this episode. And don't forget to like and subscribe below. All right, everybody. So let's dig into some bubbles. If you've ever wanted to know what the difference is between a champagne and Prosecco are, this is the episode for you. So I'm not going to give you all of the details. I'm going to give you enough so that the next time you walk into your wine shop or are looking to get some bubbles on a wine list, you know exactly what you're looking for and you can make an informed decision. So what is Prosecco. Yes, I have this one with me today. Prosecco you find in the Val do Biadene region of Italy. So that's in the Veneto. And the way in which Prosecco is made is that it's used in the tank method or the Charmat method. So there's different types of methods to make bubbles. And you know, some you might say are a little bit more technical and harder than others, but really what happens is that in order to get the bubbles or what we call a secondary fermentation, that happens in the tank. Now there's nothing wrong with picking up a bottle of Prosecco. We are seeing it more and more now on our shelves. You see it at brunch. You use it when you want to make your Aperol spritzes. You use it when you want to make your Bellinis. Um, I would just say when you think about the Prosecco, it's, you know, the category itself, you are going to have dry Proseccos, you're also going to have sweet Proseccos. So just start to think about and know what it is you're buying. Um, today I have the Mionetto Prosecco and it's perfectly good. It has some apple, apple characteristics to it. It's light, it's fruity, it's easy. I like to make bellinis or mimosas out of it, hold the osa. Um, so that's really what Prosecco is. Now, if you just imagine Italy as the boot, it is in the northeastern region of Italy. Now, let's talk about who wins here. Does Prosecco or Champagne win when it comes to bubbles? I mean, me, I am a Champagne girl, um, and I really believe that Champagne is the queen of all bubbles. I have Veuve Clicquot Rosé with me today because um, I love Madame Clicquot, and I also love the idea that Vov came out with a rosé not too long ago. And so what is the difference? When you're talking about champagne, if you think about France and you think Paris is a little dot there and you go northeast of Paris, about 80 miles, you will step into the heart of champagne. There's different cities where champagne is made, but what you need to know is that the main grape varieties in champagne are Chardonnay, number one. Um, Pinot Noir and a grape called Pinot Meunier, which we don't often see on its own. Um, I know here in America, uh, Chandon out of California makes a still Pinot Noir, which is absolutely divine. But let's go back, let's travel back to France. So we have Champagne. And what also makes it unique is that it is made in method Champenoise. Um, so the Champenoise method, which is also known as the method traditionnel. And so what that means is that in order to get the bubbles you have, it's going to go through a secondary fermentation in the bottle. So difference in tank, in the bottle. There are also a lot of regulations in Champagne around when, you know, what you can harvest, what grapes you can harvest, when, the amounts, um, as well as the fact that even non-vintage, so this is what's called a non-vintage, you'll see that there is no year on this Champagne. Why is that? So all champagne houses have their own unique style. Vove has its own style. Runar has its own. Moet Hennessy going on and on and on down the list. Even those small growers. I was drinking a different champagne um, earlier today and it was from a small grower. And, you know, they each have their own style where they want to remain consistent year on year. And so what that means is with your non-vintage champagnes, it's going to taste similar. So anytime you get that yellow label above Clico, it's going to taste similar year on year because the house has a particular style. So let's go back to also the price differences. 
why is champagne so much more expensive than your Prosecco? You know, you can get a Prosecco for, I don't know, $13, $14 in the United States. And your average champagne, you know, a good champagne will probably run you at minimum $40 on up. And then we're not even going to talk about vintage champagne today because that's a whole other glass of wine. Um, So that's something else. But you know, when we're making champagne in the traditional method, it's pretty labor intensive. So you make a still wine and then you have a secondary fermentation in bottle, which creates the bubbles. And then you have to do a bunch of things with a bunch of French words called tiras and dosage. And it goes on and on and on. So when you think about that, That's why champagne hits the market. Not only is it coming from France, sure, this is coming from Italy, but it's coming from France. It requires longer aging time. Um, It also, the grapes are super expensive. The land is super expensive in champagne. And, you know, but really it makes the best sparkling in the world. Not to say that you can't find good Prosecco and Prosecco you want to drink all the time or good Cava because I love all of those things. And I think everything has a time and a place. And if you're here to explore your palate and to learn more about bubbles and what goes into them, then I would say just drink your way around the bubbles of the world. Start with a little Italian, maybe move to a little bit of Cava and start to also learn which one of the houses of Champagne you prefer and you lean towards. Um, I'm a little bit partial to certain Champagnes, which, you know, if you stay tuned, maybe I'll I'll give you a list of the Champagnes I really love, especially if you're new to Champagne and you wanna try them out. So stay tuned for that list. If we go back to the difference between non-vintage and vintage champagne, as I said, you know, most champagne you're going to see on the market is non-vintage. So it's that consistent house style that you see year after year. And so what happens is the champagne houses hold back reserve wines every year so that they can blend into that year's harvest to do some fine tuning, some tweaking, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And voila, they have their house style for the year. And so in order to have a vintage champagne, it has, the champagne has to be 100% from that year. Anyway, let's go back to the fun. Go on and get your, go to your local shop support them, find the Prosecco. It does not have to be this one. Find a champagne. It does not have to be this one and taste to your palate's delight. Also, whatever you do, do not add OJ to this. Uh, uh, uh. This is not the kind of wine that you add OJ or a little bit of something, something to it. This should be drunk on its own. Both of these are great for food. Prosecco is one of these ones that I love for brunch. I love to kick off with a glass of Prosecco as an aperitif before I start my evening. Um, And champagne, uh, I just love all the time. If you haven't had champagne and fried chicken, maybe I'll do that as a taste test next time. But if you haven't had that, you definitely should. One more quick thing. No, you cannot call Prosecco champagne. You cannot call Cava champagne. You cannot call American sparkling champagne. Only wines coming out of the champagne region have that lovely name and that wonderful designation. But what I will say is that all champagne is sparkling but not all sparkling is champagne. And one thing that you may not also know about champagne is that you can find it in a variety of styles. So you'll see sometimes it has names on the label like brute. So you see right here down in the corner, brute. That really means dry. You can also get extra dry. You can get zero dosage. You can get demi-sec and the list goes on and on. But for today's purposes, I really want to share with you, for those of you who are exploring the beautiful, wonderful world of champagne, I want to share with you some of my favorites to get started. So if you're new to the world of champagne, number one, go out there and pick up a bottle of Yellow Label Vauve Clicquot. It's a great entry point into champagne and it'll also, you know, make your palate zing and pop and you can start to taste some nuances um, of the champagne itself. Number two, one of my personal favorites for many, many reasons um, is Boulanger. That's B-O-L-L-I-N-G-E-R. Boulanger is the one that is often featured in James Bond. Um, British royalty loves it. And, you know, since I consider myself somewhat royalty, just kidding. Um, No, it's just one of my favorites. Number three, Runar Blanc de Blanc. Blanc means white. And so white of white, what that's telling you is that the only grape variety that's being used in that champagne 
is Chardonnay. The other two grapes used in Champagne, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, are red grape varieties. And the, the next one that I would really highly recommend, depending upon how far your budget stretches, is to pick up a bottle of Krug. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Now for all of you who are out there and may have some other suggestions of small grower producers, I would love to hear about them. Comment below and share with me what your favorite champagne is. And also if you have any good cocktails you're making out of Prosecco, hit me up as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We can't wait to share more about culture and travel and all things wine coming up in our future episodes. And as we say here at Vino Karma, continue to go out there and create change in the world one sip at a time. Cheers.